coming up on the DMT One to One Show episode 66 on the 3rd of July 2014, an interview with Paul Anthony, the CEO of the company Rumblefish. Hello everyone and welcome to the DMT One to One show, uh, the show where we talk about uh, the best uh, startups, uh, uh, digital music companies and uh, digital music projects around. And uh, uh, this week it's a real pleasure to welcome Paul Anthony, the CEO of the company Rumblefish. So hi Paul and thanks for joining me from uh, Portland, Oregon. How's it going? It's going great. Thanks for having me on the show. Appreciate it's it. It's a real pleasure to have you. And, you know, I've been familiar with Rumblefish for uh, a, a number of years now. So I want to hear all about the company and uh, make sure that our audience knows about it as well. So uh, first of all, let's talk about uh, the beginnings. So the company has been around for a long time. So uh, tell us a little bit how it all got started and, and what the first steps of Rumblefish were. Yeah, so Rumblefish started in uh, 1996, quite some time ago. Um, and it was actually a company built to license my music as a film composer um, and producer. Uh, and I started it while I was at university, uh, at the University of Oregon on the West Coast here in the U.S. And uh, for the first several years, it was really just a vehicle for me to help pay for school. And right. uh, then what it turned into was um, a lot of other students and then artists and labels locally and regionally needed their music um, to get into movies and TV shows. So. That's what started the beginning of Rumblefish, and in um, in the mid um, aughts, in about 2005 ish, 2006, we really scaled up and went from a, a boutique catalog of about 30,000 songs that we shopped mainly to film and TV uh, for labels and publishers up to what we do now, which is a um, a full service. Uh, micro licensing business. Yeah, and so uh, talking about that, so in t uh, around 2005, this was pre, uh, you know, YouTube blowing up, pre uh, the real explosion of uh, uh, home uh, movie creation, essentially. So, uh, w when did you start seeing that there was going to be a need for uh, a large catalog of tracks uh, that could be licensed at a, at a reasonable rate by people that were not just movie studios and, and big uh, TV programs? Yeah, it was right around the beginning of YouTube. Um, right. We were uh, at the beginning of when we started to become successful in the early 2000s. It wasn't very popular for indie artists to license music into ads and um, and work with brands. It was quite frowned upon, actually. And so we were we were happy to open up that avenue for independent artists. But quickly, there was a lot of competition. So we looked for a new um, large space to get into. And we decided to bet the farm on social video because right. you could see things converging. I mean, similar to how it's much cheaper and effective to build a recording studio now sure. because the equipment is um, just more accessible and a lower price point. We saw uh, phones and desktop computers, and we didn't know tablets were coming, but um, just devices in general, being able to get into not, you know, a limited audience's um, hands, but a much broader audience. Because in film and TV, we're really selling, we were selling a small catalog of artists to a very small uh, customer base. Yeah. Maybe um, a thousand um, privileged professionals that were able to make the movies, TV shows, and ads that had a real budget to license music. So we thought um, with where the internet was going and with social video just barely starting, um, and it, right around the beginning of YouTube, that uh, it made a lot of sense to aim for having hundreds of millions of customers who are making um, short form video for you know their friends or for you know GoPro videos now that type of thing, and it really paid off in the long run. Yeah, absolutely. And so, uh, so let's talk. Uh, you know, on, if you look, if you people go on the website of the company, so it's rumblefish.com, they'll see that there are essentially uh, three uh, products that you have uh, uh, as listed. So essentially, uh, of course, the licensing side, which is the uh, what you still do, which is working with uh, t t TV studios and uh, uh, movie studios, is the music licensing store, and you also work, of course, with uh, uh, ads, video games, and all sorts of other different uh, uh, types of uh, bigger uh, media. Uh, and so that's of course still there. And so I guess uh, the friendly music uh, uh, business instead is the, the one that is more related to micro licensing. And so uh, can you tell me a little bit more about how the technology for that evolved? Of course, uh, it evolved over a number of years and how you essentially adapted to the request of the marketplace to, to shape the service. Sure. Yeah. And, and we're about to launch a new site in July and it focuses on um, the three areas that 
that um, we offer to to artists and to um, to licensees, and that is micro licensing. Oh, great! Uh, awesome. Um, yeah, YouTube monetization and license verification. So those are our three areas of focus. And so what you're talking about with friendly music um, has to do with our micro licensing business. And it's become very successful. Uh, in 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 short, what it is is providing great soundtracks to anyone who's making online videos. That could be from our website, uh, from Friendly Music, or from any number of our customers. And we had just um, a very public launch of one of our new partners, uh, their publicly traded company called Shutterstock. Yep. And um, they're over $300 million uh, business annually, and um, they, they grow quite substantially each year. And they have a history of licensing images and video footage to a lot of the same people who, who I mentioned earlier are using um, video, uh, either short form video, long form video online, and they wanted to add music to their offering. So that's one area or one example of how micro licensing works, where we go and sign up artists and labels from all over the world and find new and interesting um, video applications or marketplaces like a Shutterstock, uh, where they can get their music license and get compensated. Sure. And so, uh, talking about the artists that you have signed up to the platform, uh, are we talking here uh, mostly about independent, independent artists? Do you also have deals with labels? And how may they work, especially considering that labels, uh, uh, you know, would, f for example, also want to be considered for the bigger uh, side of, of the deals uh, with the TV and, and movie studios? Yeah, so we have... Um we have our deals in place. Uh, we've been working for over a decade with the movie studios and, and ad agencies. And, um, and so it, it, it all depends what you'd like to sign up for. Yeah. So we have artists from all over the world. We have about two and a half million songs. And we add about 10,000 or more songs every week. So the catalog has grown considerably over the past several years. And we let the artists and labels choose. Right? We really believe that it's, it's your content. You get to decide what you where what you do with it and where you want it to be used. So if you'd like us to promote it to movies, TV shows, and ads, happy to do that for you. Or if you'd like us to focus on YouTube monetization or um, micro licensing, then um, we'll offer those services to you as well. But you choose, and then we go out and license that music. We don't charge any upfront fees or storage fees or service fees. Um, we only take a percentage of uh, the licenses that we secure on your behalf. Great, awesome. And so, uh, looking at friendly music, uh, how do you work, and how do you set the pricing for the tracks? Is it based on the project budget, on the on the potential, uh, uh, you know, number of viewers of the project? Uh, how do you work that? Yeah, so there's a few different models. So um, the first is uh, subsidized. So right. when you sign up for a service like one of our customers, Animoto, um, Animoto has millions of users, and their service. Um, you pay for it as either uh, an individual or as a professional, and they basically uh, collect a, a subscription fee from you, and we take a percentage of that fee for the, for the music. Right. So for the users, the music feels free, but we're, we're, we baked in the prices into the subscription for the service. So that we call that a subsidized model. Or we charge for the license fees outright, and that's like our Shutterstock client. So on Shutterstock, when you buy a license, it says, here's... Um, how you get to use this music for different tiers of license. For them, there's a standard licensed and enhanced license at two different price points. And then we collect those license fees and remit them back to you. And another benefit is we're able to share the information about where your music is licensed. Um, we, we are a large participant in YouTube for, um, for claiming for our catalog including you know individual artists and also large partners like CD baby right and and we can give a lot of information to artists uh, and labels for where their music is used so there's a lot of value in the license fees but it's also interesting to know that some of your songs are popular on a particular application with a particular audience in in a certain region of the world Absolutely, and uh, for any listener that uh, is a client of uh, CD Baby, if you go into their licensing options when you sign up, uh, there is uh, an opportunity to actually license the tracks uh, uh, to Rumblefish for use in the in the micro license service. If I am correct, that's right. right. Yeah. So okay. uh, when you sign up for CD Baby, just opt into their sync program, 
and that is uh, we we deliver that service for CD Baby and their their artists and labels. Yeah, and so uh, looking at the technology side of things, uh, uh, the third uh, essentially main product that you see if you go on the Rumblefish website is uh, the Rumblefish API. And so uh, I've been to a, a bunch of music hack days now over the last few years, and so uh, and uh, and my audience has heard a lot about APIs over the last few years as well. So I'm sure they're pretty well versed in what what it is. Uh, but as yeah. far as how you uh, decided to structure that and how you implement it. What, what is the main play and uh, who are uh, the main uh, clients of, of the service? Yeah, so we, we built the API because as we started to get uh, into social video around 2005, 2006, we learned that um, video applications, slideshow applications, or like business presentation applications. So you can imagine everything from uh, Prezi to Slide Rocket or PowerPoint, and then the Animotos, social cams, um, of the world and any sort of slideshow um, software as well, they were really good at building their product yeah. and they were completely lost when it came to how do we find music or um, how do we make waveforms, what are, the, what are the BPMs of this track. So we bridged the gap between not just the music rights but also how to find quickly in just a few taps or clicks. Um, a soundtrack that helps you tell the story you're trying to tell for your your slideshow, your business presentation, or your video. Yeah. And so that's that's um, the intent of the API. And we've also um, built some repositories. Um, uh, we have an SDK that we've put out both on iOS and Android, and it includes things like um, our mood map. Yeah. Which, which which you can also see on the front page of friendlymusic.com. It helps people say, my video feels like this. Um, and we give them a soundtrack that's either happy or depressed or angry or whatever emotion you're trying to, yeah. to convey in, in your story, as well as um, we have a full-time editorial music supervision team. And what they do is, you know, if, you're, if you're a kid making a skateboard video, you can just type in action, sports, skate, and we'll recommend in many different genres yeah. music that fits that situation similar to like how a song works in the in music streaming yeah and I, of course I would recommend to go and check out the friendly music site as well because they, uh, that uh, mood map actually looks pretty cool so uh, I think uh, our listeners would enjoy having a look at that and uh, uh, and so uh, looking at uh, uh, the ecosystem of for, for uh, licensing music as a whole we've seen quite a few companies come in over the last uh, sort of two or three years uh, uh, that are working in this space because there is of course uh, a pretty large opportunity to uh, grab a slice of this pie. So how do you feel you guys are positioned in, in that sense uh, in terms of the, the relationships you've built and the catalog uh, as opposed to other companies that are coming in into it now? Yeah, um, yeah. there's a lot of entrants. Uh, we're flattered by several of those entrants imitating some of the things that we've done. Um, and, and frankly, any business that exists uh, with a mission to pay artists, especially independent artists, money, we're big fans of. Yeah. Um, that said, we have quite the head start. Uh, we have the largest pre-cleared catalog in the world uh, with two and a half million um, songs. And that's not just the sound recordings for those songs, but also uh, the compositions. And as well, we have a, a significant customer base. So you know, large uh, marketplaces, apps, and businesses, um, we really have worked very hard to build this infrastructure um, along with the um, some license verification services, which we'll be announcing and promoting um, later this summer, probably in the next couple months. That's great. So, as far as, far as you know, how we stack up to the competition, we really like to um, uh, think of ourselves as our greatest competition, and uh, we're licensing over fifty thousand soundtracks a day, and uh, we have almost seventy million licenses now issued, and we're the largest micro licensing player in the world. So we really just want to internally push ourselves and encourage our artists and label and uh, partners like CD Baby to push us to really um, broaden the industry because I think that rising tide raises all ships. Yeah. The more micro-licensing that happens is not only good for Rumblefish and our artists but for other players in the space. And um, yeah, we're excited because everything 
is going quickly and, and growing quite well. Yeah, exactly. And so talking about data, have you seen an improvement in the type of data that you get uh, from artists? Because I, I would imagine that uh, tracks that you ingested, uh, say, 12, uh, 12 years ago, uh, wouldn't have had uh, nearly as much detailed data as the ones that you get now, even including, uh, you know, th fundamental things like publishing information or any, any of that kind of stuff. So has that improved over the, over the years? It's definitely improved. Um, the way we like to think of it is, um, since iTunes uh, really took hold and now obviously is being um, slowly cannibalized by music streaming, people have understood a digital marketplace. Yeah. So in a physical marketplace, the best way to get attention was to get an end cap or have a great street team or get on the radio. But in a digital marketplace, uh, metadata is king. And if you don't have great metadata, then it's like putting your album in an unmarked box in a huge warehouse and yeah. hoping someone will find it. So uh, we found that people have really improved their game. But, but honestly, um, there's still a lot of really bad data out there. So what we've done uh, is, is really expand our tools to make the metadata better. And that includes an acquisition we made um, last year for a company called Catalogic. Right. Um, we acquired Catalogic uh, for many reasons, but one of them is because they have um, content enhancement tools, like uh, metadata enhancement tools. So we're able to analyze all the music that comes in, create waveforms, get BPM, do mood, and et cetera. Um, and uh, later this year, we plan on offering some of that metadata back to our artists and labels so that they can take advantage of that and it just be an added benefit of working with us. But um, even when the data is good, the challenge is that everyone creates different data. Right. So some people may have um, different genre names. Um, you, well, you know as well as I do that uh, genres are subjective and everyone thinks they sound like Radiohead or Jay Z, and sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't. Yeah. But um, it's uh, normalizing the data is a lot of the work that we do internally, even if the data is good. But I'd encourage anyone out there that has a catalog or that's building a service, um, an app, or anything to really uh, spend some time on the data because it's going to impact the experience for your users in a, in a big way. Yeah, and discovery is kind of a funny a funny aspect of this because uh, a lot of the digital music services that are operating on a consumer level are developing their own systems and a lot of the licensing companies that are working uh, like you guys do are developing their own systems as well. And so I wonder if there's going to be a point uh, where the, the two are going to be able to talk together and actually uh, cooperate somehow because I'm sure there's good points to each of those systems and, uh, and we're always looking to improve that uh, kind of uh, discovery uh, experience. So... <laughs> it's fun. Yeah, it's funny you say that. We have uh, we do kind of like uh, data exchanges and and a little um, meeting of the minds type of summits with a lot of services that some people would consider to be competitive. Right. Um, just to share notes and see if there's ways that we can help each other. Because usually when you look under the covers, there's um, more that's different than similar, and uh, there's not as much direct competition as you might imagine. Yeah. So we've actually part, you know, just four or five years ago, many would have thought that the the labels and uh, publishers that we've signed up are direct competitors with us because we both compete in traditional licensing yeah. for film, TV, and ads, but uh, none of none of those competitors worked in micro licensing. So, for example, we've been working with APM one of the world's largest uh, production music libraries. Incredible catalog and great team over there, uh, led by Adam Taylor. And we've, we've, we've created a really successful partnership with them for micro-licensing, and we don't compete on traditional. And they, they actually have a lot of really great search insights and great metadata. Yeah. So a lot of that's going on. So ho hopefully, it, it, like I said before, rising tide raises all ships. Hopefully, we can all share a little bit and uh, and serve each other's best interests. Yeah, sure, of course. And uh, uh, you know, uh, finally, I wanted to ask you about uh, platforms. So, uh, when we're talking about friendly music, of course, the majority of the traffic that you get is going to be uh, driven by YouTube. Uh, majority of the custom that you get and, and videos that are uh, displayed there. So, but uh, at the same time, there is a bit of a wave of people thinking, you know, oh, maybe we should have our videos outside of YouTube and actually get more control over them. Uh, in that sense, are you seeing uh, some uh, more platforms starting to gain traction? Of course. YouTube is probably 98.5% of everything else, but uh, uh, I, I started seeing uh, uh, some 
consumers moving on to different uh, streaming services or different video services to uh, provide uh, to have a more control over, over the videos they have right good question so we found it to be quite different than the percentages that you mentioned we right, found cool. youtube to really be about 40 45 percent of wow. online video um it's it's easy to uh, because so many popular videos and viral videos especially live on YouTube, it's easy to think of them as the center of the online video universe, which they definitively are, but they aren't a majority of the activity. And um, we, one of our customers is Vimeo. We provide music to Vimeo for the Vimeo Music Store. And uh, we also are working um, in development with other social video sites and there's a lot of these um, mini communities that are actually quite large. Yeah. You can think of Animoto or Social Cam um, as, as examples. Stupaflix is, a, is another brand uh, in France that's doing very well. And they have millions, in some cases tens of millions of users that um, have a very specific uh, uh, um, combined interest, yeah. whether that be in a sport or... Uh, whether it, it be in some certain type of activity. And these micro communities are becoming very strong and they're doing very well. So we're, we're looking to tap into as many of these micro communities as possible. And we actually signed a deal with a very large one just uh, a couple of weeks ago, which we'll be announcing hopefully in the next couple of weeks. Uh, another community that's, that's focused on another online activity and there's millions of users and it's very vibrant, um, a lot of revenue flowing through it to be a good thing for, for independent artists to tap into. That's awesome. It's great to hear, especially in light of the latest debates around YouTube. And actually, I'm going to have, uh, I should have the head of uh, Impala uh, tomorrow on the show to chat about that. Oh, good. That. <laughs> that will be heated. Yeah, it's going to be fun. <laughs> and uh, and uh, no, that's that's fantastic. And so, you know, you mentioned that you have a new product uh, coming out in July, of course, uh, still probably in, in, uh, in you know, wraps. Uh, but uh, as far as what you can tell us, uh, 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 what's the direction there? Sure. Um, I can't tell you exactly what it is, but I can tell sure. you what problem it solves. So we issue so many licenses every day. I mean, when we started Rumblefish, we were licensing less than a thousand licenses a year. And now we license 50 to 60, sometimes 70 or 80,000 licenses a day. Wow. So you can imagine that since we have all these different um, customers all over the world um, that are users of these various platforms um, when they license a song and uh, they show up at some of the social video networks uh, the content ID systems get in the way so what we've done is we've come up with a way to get past the content ID systems not by going around them but by cooperating with them and so uh, when you license, issue as many licenses as we do every day yeah. you can imagine being a user on a site paying real money uh, for a license to do it right, not doing what many people do and you know steal the music or not license it for your video. And then you get to YouTube or a similar video network and the content ID system slaps you down right. and says, hey, you don't have the rights to use this when really you do. It's just, there's just, it's like a cat trying to talk to a dog. There's just no yeah. way for the two to communicate. So what we've done is make that easy for uh, uh, any sort of user of music that's licensed music to communicate the rights that they've got and, and make it easier for everyone. That's great, and uh, excited to hear more about that when the announce uh, when it's announced officially. And uh, well, Paul, it was a real pleasure uh, to uh, have you on the show today. And uh, again, I would recommend people to go and check out rumblefish.com for more information if they don't know a whole lot about the company. But I'm sure that they learned a lot through our chat. And uh, again, thanks so much for your time. Yeah, thank you. A big fan of what you're doing, and uh, thanks for the time today. Thank you, and thanks so much for listening to the DMT One to One show this week. You can find everything out on digitalmusictrends.com and clicking through to the DMT One to One, where I interview a different company or interesting digital music project every week. And also check out the news show on digitalmusictrends.com, where every week we cover the latest news in the digital music industry. Thanks so much for uh, listening. Have a fantastic week, and until next time. If you enjoyed watching or listening to the show and would like to find more, head on to digitalmusictrends.com.